Good evening, everybody. This is uh, Darius Sesemi with GV Wire Unfiltered. Uh, welcome uh, to another episode uh, coming to you live from Fresno, California. We have a great guest um, for you this evening, Dr. Trita Parsi, which I will introduce in a, in a few minutes to discuss uh, Middle East issues, uh, geopolitics of what's, what's shipping up in that part of the world, and what are the opportunities, uh, challenges for United States and you know how do we get to greater uh, peace in that area and how do how do we avoid conflict uh, that's coming up here uh, in, in a couple of minutes but before i, I uh, introduce uh, dr parsi a couple of slides we need to put up from uh, uh, several events that took shaped up over the week first of all let's put up slide three we did a poll uh, do you worry that us will be pulled into a widespread middle east war um Almost two thirds of the respondents on Facebook, a Facebook poll, said yes. We're concerned about that. And then, of course, what happened uh, last night in Iowa? Uh, Donald Trump, uh, ex-president, uh, past president Donald Trump, uh, pulled that off with a giant margin, thirty uh, percent lead over number two and number three spots, DeSantis and and um, Mrs. Haley. Um, no surprise there to to many folks. Uh, I know some folks are very supportive or not supportive at all of uh, the ex president. Okay, um, let's move on to a couple of things and uh, in, in, that's shaping up in the Middle East. Um, so we've all heard of the Houthi uh, rebels striking U.S. Um, owned ships off of the coast of Yemen, raising tensions. That's one of the articles that uh, GV Wire ran. Uh, and of course, Trita will be uh, talking about that. And then slide seven, the unintended consequences of military strikes in Yemen. What should Biden do? That's an aggregation on uh, GV Wire from, uh, I think it's a Time Magazine article that uh, Dr. Parsi wrote, uh, I want to say yesterday or the day before. Um, so anyhow, a lot of stuff happening in that part of the world. Um, I'm going to also put, uh, I'm sorry, one other slide. Let's put up slide 24. Uh, this is a recent po Gallup poll that came out, um, I want to say last week, on U.S. presidential favorability um, rating. So Robert F. Kennedy Jr. has the highest favorability rating uh, of the three folks, three I think front runners. Are these two front runners? So Donald Trump at 42, Joe Biden at 41, um, and again um, Robert Kennedy uh, Jr. at 52 percent. Okay, from there let's uh, move on to a couple of other slides. Um, let's put on let's put on slides 25, 26, 27, and tw uh, yeah, we we'll just go from 20, 25 to 29. Let's start with 25. This is from Robert Pape um, to the Associated Press. Israel's siege on Gaza is one of the most intense civilian punishment campaigns in history. Uh, slide 26 is about um, you know, 40 to 45% of, of the 29,000 munitions are unguided. Again, these are all uh, coming in sources, CNN. Let's go to slide 27. More journalists have been killed in the first 10 weeks of Israel-Gaza war than ever. Killed in a single country over an entire year. And then uh, over 100 U United Nations workers in Gaza have been killed. And the last one um, from Rear Admiral Daniel Hagari. Uh, from IDF. While the, while the Israeli Defense Forces is balancing accuracy right now, we've, we're focused on what causes maximum damage. So, um, and of course, there's been, you know, lots of uh, terrorist attacks on the other side over the last, you know, 10 or 15 years or longer, really. Uh, and of course, October 7th, the, the, the biggest attack, which killed over 1,200 civilians, mainly Israelis, and uh, kidnapping of over 200 folks, uh, men, women, and children by Hamas, which is uh, labeled as a terrorist group in the, uh, by the United States. Okay, with that, let me um, now introduce Dr. Uh, Trita Parsi, our esteemed guest, 
Uh, he's the executive vice president of the Quincy Institute for Responsible Statecraft, a distinguished award-winning author and an expert in Middle East affairs with a profound understanding of Iran and U.S. foreign policy. His insights have garnered uh, attention, having been featured in Time magazine, as well as uh, prominent platforms such as Daily Show, Jon Stewart, Colbert Report, CNN, BBC, Al Jazeera, NBC, New York Times, TED Talk, and many others. Acclaimed author of notable books, including The Treacherous Alliance. If you have an image on that, let's put those up. Treacherous Alliance, uh, The Secret Dealings of Iran, Israel, and the United States. Um, Paul or Chad, let's put those uh, slides up on the books. There we go. And um, which won the silver medal of the two, that, that first book that I mentioned won the silver medal of 2008 Arthur Ross Book Award from the Council on Foreign Relations. A single role of the dice, Obama's Diplomacy with Iran, which was selected by Foreign Affairs as the best book of 2012 on the Middle East and his latest work, Losing an Enemy, Obama, Iran, and the Triumph of Diplomacy. Uh, he's also been uh, attended many meetings at the White House and was also on the 2020 uh, foreign policy team uh, and the campaign team for President, uh, at the time, candidate Joe Biden. So with that introduction, uh, welcome, Dr. Parsi, uh, to the to the show. Uh, give us a give give the viewers in Central California uh, a, a brief background on what you see as geopolitical issues. What are the problems today, which, you know, we hear in the news, although a lot less lately, but, uh, you know, since, you know, 1st of October, uh, almost daily on, on uh, the, the issue that's shaping up in that part of the world. First, the attack on Israel by Hamas, then the retaliation and the killing of, you know, the numbers keep going up. And I don't know what the numbers are today, 25, 23,000 civilians killed. And we have some data on that on Israel claims there are about 8,000 of those were Hamas militants. So kind of give us a, what you see out there. And then, and then I want to, the second part of this, I want to get your perspective on where you see uh, solutions. Where, how do we get to a more uh, peaceful and prosperous, prosperous world, especially the Middle East? Uh, and because you're at your institute, the Quincy Institute, you know, is about, and I want you to tell the audience maybe a little bit about that, about policy work and not so much military action. So, or working, diplomatically to peace, not with a, a military force. So welcome, Dr. Parsi. Thank you so much, Darius. It's a great pleasure uh, being with you and, and, and with your viewers. You, you asked a very important question, uh, which is, you know, what are the root causes and the geopolitical dimensions and driving forces of this conflict? And of course, this conflict has been going on for some time. Uh, uh, the Israelis have been occupying Palestinian territory uh, for several decades now, and even during the time of the peace process, when there actually was a peace process and when there actually was prospects for a two-state solution, even during that period, unfortunately, uh, we saw a growth of illegal settlements um, and uh, creation of new facts on the ground that rendered a final two-state solution more and more difficult. And at this point, most people have been saying that the two-state solution, or the peace process at least, is essentially dead. But one of the things that came out of the disaster, the, the horrors of the Hamas attack, is a realization that what many states in the region, and certainly decision makers in Washington, had come to believe was false. And that was the belief that the Palestinian issue no longer mattered. And that as a result, instead of pushing for a two-state solution, the United States should be pushing for normalization agreements between Israel and key Arab states. This all started under uh, President Trump and the Abram Accords, which very explicitly said that we're moving beyond the Palestinian issue. So there was no longer any effort or any pressure on Israel to compromise, to uh, help create the circumstances that would allow for a Palestinian state um, uh, or anything of that matter. In fact, the Palestinians weren't even at the table any longer. Instead, it was all about normalization, 
integrating Israel and some of the Arab states economically, politically, uh, joining forces uh, against the perceived threat from Iran, but nothing on the Palestinian issue. And part of the reason why this belief had become so strong was because for the last decade or so, objectively, the Palestinian issue had started to resonate less with the broader Arab publics, not because they stopped caring, but because there were so many crises in the Arab world with the Arab Spring, the civil war in Syria, the disaster in Libya, et cetera, so that the Palestinian issue essentially was pushed aside. The error, however, was to believe that it had been pushed aside permanently. Many of us did warn that any effort to completely shut the door on the prospects for a two-state solution uh, would only eventually bring about a return to violence. Now, how it would happen, when it would happen, no one really could tell or predict, but that it would happen, I think many observers of the region recognized because it was simply impossible to assume that several million Palestinians could be forced to reconcile with the idea that their fate is to permanently and indefinitely be under occupation. That has never worked in history and was not likely to work here either. And unfortunately, that has now come true through these horrific attacks. What is so shocking to me, however, is that that's not the lesson that is being learned right now in Washington. Instead, there is a push to uh, pursue normalization. The Biden administration essentially says that these attacks were there to sabotage the uh, normalization between Israel and Saudi Arabia that the Biden administration was trying to broker. I, I think there's no doubt that the Hamas organization probably calculated that that would be one of the potential consequences of their attack. I don't think it was a central uh, motivation for their attack. If that's what they were trying to do, there were far less bloody things uh, that they could have done that would not have also brought about this horrific destruction in Gaza. And now the Biden administration essentially is saying that they're going back, they're keeping it alive, the idea that there should be a normalization between Israel and Saudi Arabia. Although now they say through some form of uh, concessions on the Palestinian side. However, it's very unlikely to be able to work out that way. The Netanyahu government, Netanyahu himself is bragging that he is the person that made the two-state solution impossible. Uh, his right-wing coalition would never stand for any type of a compromise on this issue. And the mood in Israel in general as a result of the Hamas attack is certainly not one in favor of greater compromise. On the contrary, their calculation or their conclusion has been that they were mistaken in thinking that they could manage the threat from Hamas. Instead, they have to eliminate it. And that's part of the reason why you're seeing this military campaign uh, in Gaza right now. I do not believe that any of these things will bring about any type of a solution in the region. The longer this war goes on, the further away we will be from peace. But I'll be happy to go into that in, in greater detail. So you brought up a very interesting point in, in that, you know, when, with the Abraham Accords, Palestinians were not at the table. Did anybody advise that, to, to the best of your knowledge, uh, President Trump about, you know, if you want to bring peace in that region? And when he was campaigning, I remember in, in the debates he was talking about, I'm going to be a broker of peace in the Middle East between Palestinians and, and Israelis. Did any, do you think anybody or any of his advisors said, hey, if you want to create a long-term peace, less hostility, you know, in, in, in the region, less, you know, suicide attacks or terrorist attacks onto Israel, you need to involve the key players. And I mean, half the equation is the Palestinians. Do you know if, if anybody actually had, had that conversation or would, did anybody communicate that uh, with the president at the time? So the, the Trump administration uh, was very much following the lead of the Israelis on this one. And their narrative was that there is no need for uh, a two-state solution. Uh, that if you just normalize relations between Saudi Arabia, Iran, uh, uh, UAE, Bahrain, Israel, et cetera, that's actually more important because what you need to do is to build an Arab-Israeli coalition against Iran. And that was the logic that they were pursuing. The Palestinians were an annoying footnote in their calculations. No one was really trying to make them part of the real story here. The belief 
thoroughly and I think genuinely was that the region had moved beyond the Palestinians and now it was time for the United States to do so as well. And they were sadly mistaken, badly mistaken on that. Got it. Tell us, you know, first of all, who are the, if you know, I'm pretty sure you do, who are Houthi rebels? Uh, they're funded or backed by the Iran regime. That's what we hear in, in the news. And they're in Yemen, right at the tight point of, um, of the Red Sea, at the bottom south end of that, uh, where a lot of the, uh, you know, cargo ships, uh, you know, traveling to Europe and uh, United States, uh, that the east coast of the United States actually traveled through. So who are the Houthis? Why are they getting engaged? Why are they getting involved? I mean, I hear on NPR that the Houthis are getting involved so long as Israel continues to bombard Gaza. When they stop the bombarding Gaza or slow down, they slow down the bombings. Is that or the attack on the cargo ships? Uh, can you give us a little bit of a background on who these sure. guys are, who funds them, what kind of a... I mean, most Americans probably haven't heard of who are Houthi, Houthis in Yemen. And I mean, how do they get their sophisticated missiles, you know, et cetera? Well, it's quite sad, actually, that most Americans don't know who the Houthis are, mindful of the fact that the United States has been bombing the Houthis or helping the Saudis bomb the Houthis for more than eight years in this uh, Yemeni civil war. Um, uh, the Houthis is a movement that started several decades ago um, uh, by a gentleman named the Houthis. The Houthis themselves don't call themselves Houthis. They call themselves Ansar Hezbollah. Um, and uh, it's a movement uh, that became a very powerful force within the Yemeni civil war. Um, uh, they, at one point earlier on, were actually aligned with the Saudis and they turned against each other. They're an off branch of Shiism, but not at all the same Shiism that you see in Iran. But the Iranians have managed to take advantage of the civil war in Yemen. They started supporting the Houthis, primarily militarily training, providing these very sophisticated weaponry. I mean, this, uh, 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 we call them a militia or, or rebels, but they have ballistic missiles. That's, that's not what you see most rebel movements having in any other country. Um, and they've taken advantage of that. It has been part of their way of, in their rivalry with Saudi Arabia, which now has been um, um, pacified to a certain extent as a result of the Chinese brokering uh, a Saudi-Iranian normalization. Uh, but the Houthis essentially have come out of the civil war in Yemen um, uh, successfully, victoriously. They're uh, aligned with Iran, but they're not an Iranian proxy. They act on their own. They have criticized the Iranians publicly, uh, you know, essentially saying that the Iranians are not um, uh, acting decisively enough, tough enough uh, against Israel, for instance. Uh, but they're part of what the Iranians call a network that uh, a network that is called the axis of resistance. That's their own terminology. And what they're resisting against is the, the United States and the regimes in the region that are supported by the United States. Uh, now, why they have become so involved in this is not necessarily a mystery. Um, they have been very explicit that they're going to continue to target ships that are heading towards Israel through the Red Sea uh, until the Israelis stop their slaughter in Gaza. As of late, they've now started targeting other ships as well because the United States attacked the Houthis in order to open up the, the sea lanes for all vessels and to restore American deterrence. And now we see that the Houthis have started targeting American ships as well. Um, I, I found it interesting, I've not listened to radio for a while, I found it interesting that you said that in NPR, they actually do state that the Houthi demand is that Israel stop its bombardment of Gaza. Because in most print media in the United States, the fact that that has been their demand and the fact that there is a possibility to actually see an end to their attacks if there is a ceasefire in Gaza has actually not been mentioned. In fact, systematically, it has not been mentioned, which I think is a significant problem. It doesn't mean that that is necessarily the path the U.S. should go. One can argue for and against it. But depriving the American public of awareness that that is an option and that it is not so that the Biden administration had no choice but to use military force. That, I think, is a massive disservice that the mainstream media has done to the American public, particularly now that we see that the U.S. has now three times struck the Houthis in the last four days, 
uh, and that has not led to uh, a de-escalation or that the Houthis have stopped. Instead, they have actually intensified their attacks. And in some ways, it's also helped the Houthis because, you see, the Houthis are trying to inflict economic pain on the Israelis by making sure that ships do not go through the Red Sea to reach Israel, but instead have to go all the way around Africa, which takes longer and is much more expensive. Now, guess what? By the United States uh, retaliating against the Houthis, uh, what you have is intensified tensions in the region, which means that more ships now feel that it's unsafe for them to travel through the Red Sea. Uh, and the Houthis don't need to actually continue to successfully target any ships in the region. They just need to try. As long as they're still shooting missiles, most Western ships will choose not to go through the Red Sea. And by that, the Houthi effort to have a blockade on Israel has actually become more effective. And I think in that sense, it was a mistake, in my view, for the uh, Biden administration to take this course of action because more efficient courses of action did exist. Opening up the sea lanes, protecting the ships, I think those are given. Those are things that the United States should be pursuing. How it is pursued, however, differs. And it's not so that the Biden administration had no choice but to take military action. In well, my so view. What, what, what should have the Biden administration done to protect you know, the cargo ships going to Israel and the rest, the rest of Europe? So during the six days in which there was a ceasefire uh, in Gaza between November 24th and November 30th, uh, there was only one attack by the Houthis against any ships. Uh, so it was a significant reduction of their attacks. And when you take a look at the Iraqi militias who were striking the U.S. quite actively, those attacks reduced to zero during the six-day ceasefire. I'm On sorry, the last the day of the... I'm sorry, attacking U.S. interests where? In Iraq or? In Iraq and in Syria, uh, Iraqi militias, also close to Iran, also trained and armed by Iran, were attacking U.S. bases and, and troops. Luckily, no one had been killed, and still no one has been killed. Um, and they also were doing so in order to force a ceasefire. So during the six days that there was a ceasefire, they actually stopped all their attacks. And on the last day of the ceasefire, the Houthis issued a statement saying that they will res resume attacks if the Israelis resume their uh, bombardment of Gaza. I think from a U.S. national interest perspective, we should have gone for a ceasefire for a variety of reasons. First of all, the most important thing, the last thing the United States needs is another war in the Middle East. The American public certainly does not have any more appetite for wars in the Middle East. That, in my view, should be the absolute top priority of the president. And to achieve that, a ceasefire is actually the most effective way because A, it, would, it has good chances of pacifying the Iraqi militias. We saw that during the six day ceasefire. Same thing with the Houthis. It can help pacify the Israeli uh, Lebanese border, which is also boiling over. Uh, moreover, it's the most efficient way of getting the Israeli hostages out of the hands of Hamas. The only time hostages have been released has actually been through that ceasefire. And finally, ending uh, the slaughter in Gaza, which, uh, according to the South Africans, as they're making their case at the Interna International Criminal Court, uh, uh, Court of Justice, is a genocide. All of these things can best be achieved through a ceasefire, including, of course, making sure that the Houthis stop attacking and, as a result, the sea lanes are open. Uh, and I find it problematic that that option, which is a nonviolent option, was not exhausted first before Biden considered and took military action. You know, Biden always says that, you know, uh, military action is the option of last resort. Well, in this case, it wasn't. Have you talked to the president or anybody on his cabinet about- No, uh, your no, no I, I've not spoken to the president. My organization is in touch with uh, both executive branch and legislative branch um, uh, uh, members of um, uh, the US government. But on this specific issue, I have to say, I've never seen the administration being so unreceptive to uh, views that differ from their own on this matter. And it's, it's not just a frustration uh, for groups like mine that are not part of the government, but it's also a frustration that members of Congress are feeling, including staffers themselves uh, in Congress and perhaps most shockingly in the White House itself. I don't know uh, if the news made it out nationally, but you actually have had uh, vigils outside of the White House by White House staff asking for a ceasefire. You have interns at the White House <laughs> signing letters to the president begging for a ceasefire. So there's a lot of dissent inside 
the White House on this issue and in which a lot of folks are not in agreement with the president? Uh, uh, that, that actually, uh, GV Wire had an article that was, what is it, uh, hundreds of uh, White House staff members uh, protested a couple of days ago. A couple of questions uh, coming in from uh, Facebook Live. There's actually a lot of questions. I'm going to try to summarize and get, get to some of these. Yeah, one of the questions is, if G Gaza and, and Hamas or the Palestinians want a two-state solution, why do they attack? I mean, you don't get to a two states. And I know they wanted to get the world attention. Abraham Accords basically left them behind. But in your uh, opinion, why did they launch an attack knowing that the reaction from Israel was not going to be a, you know, a small reaction? Israel needed to protect herself and also show the world, if you come after us, there's a major price to pay. So why would if they want, why not follow a like Mahatma Gandhi, do a you know a, a, a hunger strike or you know get all kinds of um, satellite imagery uh, on on their average life and life of a Gaza on, on, on an average day? Uh, what, what is the aspirations? What can go in? What can go out? Why don't they try to communicate to the rest of the world how they're being occupied? What did the President Carter say? Uh, largest prison in the world is the Gaza Strip. That's a, in a book he wrote uh, 15, 20 years ago. Why wouldn't? Why would they attack Israel if they want to? I mean, if they want to still want to have a two-state solution, you don't. You don't. I mean, you, a mouse doesn't go after a tiger, and expect to have equal treatment. What are your <laughs> thoughts on that? So, I mean, first of all, I, I don't believe that through violence there uh, is a decent likelihood or even. Uh, um, uh, the type of an approach that should be pursued. But I think it's important to recognize the occupation has been going on. The peace process that was started in the mid-1990s was a process that uh, only started as a result of the PLO, the main Palestinian branch, recognizing Israel and disavowing violence. Now, if you're a Palestinian, you look back at the last 30 years and your conclusion is, that approach, that diplomatic, peaceful approach has been an utter failure. The Palestinians are being treated worse in the West Bank. This is not Gaza. This is not the group that attacked Israel uh, than they were before. I mean, several hundreds have been killed since the Gaza attack, even though West Bank is governed by the Palestinian Authority and not by Hamas. Moreover, I think it's also very important to understand Hamas was created partly through the help of Israel itself in the 1980s. This is all very well documented and people can look it up themselves. Uh, and this was done because back then, the Israelis uh, wanted to create a division within the Palestinian ranks and create a counter to, um, um, uh, to the PLO, which at the time they were seeing uh, as a bigger threat. Uh, and this incidentally is not, different from you know, some things that the US did, for instance, back in the uh, late 1970s, my PhD advisor, Zbigniew Brzezinski, was a national security advisor, and he was uh, uh, pushing successfully the idea that the United States should be supporting Islamic movements in Afghanistan in order to beat the Russians. That worked, but one of the consequences is that from those Islamic movements that the United States helped push for, the Taliban came out, they hosted Al Qaeda, and Al-Qaeda attacked the United States. So, and the Israelis essentially were pursuing the similar thing, uh, going for an Islamic opposition to the otherwise completely secular PLO. Arafat himself was um, uh, rather staunchly secular. Uh, and then within the Israeli government right now, you have people that still publicly say that the PA, the Palestinian Authority, is a bigger problem than Hamas, because the PA actually wants a two-state solution. Hamas does not. And if you're one of the hardliners in the Israeli government, you also do not want a two-state solution. You don't want to give up any land. You don't want to see a Palestinian state. So the idea that if, oh, if just the Hamas folks didn't attack, it's a very simplistic way of looking at a very complex situation um, in which, unfortunately, there's too many players on both sides that have been trying to undermine any pathway towards um, a two-state solution. And here, I think we also have to count in the United States, who for the last two decades have been very cognizant about how the Israeli government has systematically undermined any prospects for a two-state solution. 
uh, pushing the, uh, the Palestinians towards radicalization and concluding that um, uh, diplomacy will not yield anything for them. And frankly, we have helped uh, that happen and, and not put pressure on the Israelis not to kill the two-state solution. And here we are, uh, as a result of us not standing up for what we actually say is our policy, now we have a major war and we are going to see thousands of more people killed, radicalization on both sides, uh, anger and frustration. And you can just you know, imagine the number of people that have been traumatized by this war, clearly more of them on the Palestinian side than the Israeli side, but also on the Israeli side. We're moving further and further away from a real peace, unfortunately. Uh, those are, uh, again, great, great points. A, a couple of other uh, comments and questions. I want to get to what is Iran's role uh, in uh, Hamas and what is, uh, there's a note that came in, President Biden actually played a role in creating Hamas. Uh, do you, anything, I mean, this is just a comment from one of the viewers. Uh, is there any mm -hmm. evidence that President Biden actually no, played a no, role? I, okay. Okay. I've never heard that. I mean, Biden at the time was a senator in the United States Senate. Um, he had a role in the Foreign Policy Committee, uh, Foreign Relations Committee, but no, no, I don't think President Biden okay. or the United States itself actually played any role uh, in that. Iran plays a role, without a doubt. Uh, but I think it's important to also distinguish uh, the relationship that Iran has with Hamas and the one that he has with Hezbollah, for instance. Iran played an active role in the creation of Hezbollah in 1982 in Lebanon. Hezbollah is a Shia organization that is very closely aligned, not just militarily, politically, but also ideologically and religiously uh, with Iran. Uh, Hamas is a very, very different story. Hamas comes out of the Egyptian Muslim Brotherhood, uh, which is a Sunni organization that actually, frankly, uh, uh, has tended to be very negative and anti-Shia. In fact, the founder of Hamas was very anti-Shia and very anti-Iran. It's only after the Israelis assassinated Sheikh Yassin that you saw the Iranians becoming successful in building bridges with Hamas. Um, but even then, there were still a lot of tensions between Iran and Hamas because Hamas and Iran ended up on two different sides when it comes to the Syrian civil war, in which the Iranians supported Bashar al-Assad and the Hamas was supporting the opposition. Uh, and that reconciliation um, after the civil war came ab uh, about four or so years ago. But it's a, a relationship that has a long history of tensions. Uh, back in the 1980s, for instance, Hamas supported Saddam Hussein and his invasion of Iran. Uh, so the history between them is very tense, problematic. In the last couple of years, they moved closer together. I'm not so sure there's so much funding going from Iran to Hamas. There may be. It's just that. The, the main thing the Iranians are providing is not money. They don't have that much money. Uh, it is mainly uh, their training and military, uh, uh, providing military support uh, and uh, methods that have <clears throat> uh, made Hamas a much more potent fighting force than it was 10 years ago. Same thing with the Houthis and certainly that with Hezbollah as well. That, that's the main contribution that the Iranians have. Do the Iranians control Hamas? Were they part of this attack on October 7th? They don't control Hamas. Again, if they did, Hamas would not have sided against Iran in the Syrian uh, civil war. Uh, were they aware of this attack? According to US intelligence, the Iranians were actually taken by surprise by the attack, uh, meaning that they didn't know about it beforehand and didn't have any planning. They have, of course, uh, praised it, et cetera, and, um, uh, and view that as uh, a development that they favor. Uh, which, you know, from a U.S. perspective, of course, is highly, highly problematic. That's different, however, from them actually having had an operational role in the attack. Where do you, how do you see this uh, ending? Where, I mean, where do we go from here? Uh, if, if President, if uh, Donald Trump becomes the next president of the United States, there are several comments on that says during the Trump era, there was no wars. There was no attack on Ukraine. There was no attacks in, in the Middle East, you know, and, and Gaza, Israel, Palestine, uh, you know, Houthis. I mean, the Saudis were going after the Houthis, but, you know, where do you see this ending? And let's assume President Donald Trump is the next president of the United States, takes, which takes office, you know, we'll, we'll be taking office about four days from today, a year and four days from today. Mm -hmm. So um, I think if this attack had occurred when 
Trump, if Trump had been president, let's say it was during his first term. Um, and I'm only speculating because no one frankly knows what Trump can, would do. I mean, he's extremely unpredictable. But I would bet my money that for the first three or so weeks, he would probably have done the same thing as Biden did. Provide support, send weapons, protect Israel at the UN, et cetera, et cetera. I think, however, after three weeks, Trump would have grown tired of it because he doesn't like long dragging things with no clear exit plans. And I think he would have taken the escalation risk much more seriously than Biden has done. There's a significant risk of the US getting dragged into a war. And I think Biden, frankly, is playing it the wrong way and, and is feeding that risk rather than reducing it. I don't think Trump would have done that. I think Trump um, w did not favor any wars that he did not think favored him politically. And such a war in the Middle East would not have favored him politically. In fact, if he saw how the, uh, his support for Israel had her harmed him in the polls in the manner that Biden's support uh, for Israel has really, really harmed him in the polls in a very problematic way for Biden, I think by, uh, Trump would have shifted. Biden has not. But let's say that uh, uh, Trump comes in. First of all, I think within a couple of months, we're likely going to have a, a ceasefire. Uh, and I think it's going to come at a point in which the Israelis are going to have a very hard time claiming victory. I think they're desperately looking to be able to at least get rid of some very, very senior Hamas official in order to be able to find some sort of a face-saving way out of this. Because it's becoming increasingly clear that the cost to Israel itself in terms of casualties, in terms of international standing, in terms of a potential uh, injunction from the International Crim uh, Court of Justice um, that may determine that there's enough evidence to make it plausible that Israel is engaged in genocide and as a result puts in an injunction against it. All of those things are tremendously, tremendously problematic for Israel. So I think there is a likelihood that they will want to come out of this. The question is, by the time that happens, will there have been a major escalation in the region that drags the U.S. into that war? And this is what I think should be on top of mind of the president. His key objective should make sure the U.S. does not get dragged into another war. And that, again, in my view, necessitates um, a, a ceasefire. That's the thing that can pacify the Iraqi militias, the Lebanese border, uh, the Houthis, et cetera, et cetera. And, and I'm personally perplexed that the administration has been so adamant about not pursuing it and so adamant about blocking any pathways to a ceasefire. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, one comment and several questions that have come in. Now I want to kind of try to sum them all, all together. Uh, Trump made a statement on uh, about Ukraine. I think he was on one of the news channels. And he said, hey, if he, the day he becomes president, within 24 hours, the bloodshed stops in Ukraine. Uh, do you believe if uh, Trump becomes president, we're going to get something similar? I mean, he he he's a deal maker, and he wants to uh, end conflicts. Yeah, he's he's a, he's a business person. He wants to see you know a business flourish in that part of the world, and I'm sure he sees you know the more people get killed and displaced and hurt and losing their families or limbs or dogs. The more you know, you you know, folks get radicalized in that part of the world. He he doesn't want to see that. He doesn't want to see U.S. interests get harmed uh, by you know the, the, this war and and the support of uh, support of Israel, which is you know unilateral support of Israel by by the tr Trump administration by the Biden administration. Do you think if Trump became president, that within 24 hours? And I know I'm asking a big loaded question. <laughs> And then after that, I want to go to uh, what, what do you think the future of Iran is going to be? But do you think that that could uh, end if Trump became president? So, you know, the idea that he will make peace during 24 hours, uh, I wouldn't put my money on that. I do believe, however, he will pursue a different policy in Ukraine. Uh, I don't think that there is any support in his base for continued billions of dollars being sent to Ukraine. Um, and uh, I think there is, and, and he's going to be very sensitive to that. And of course, as you know, Ukraine is also very much involved. It's, it's a factor in a lot of the scandals that um, uh, were brewing 
that in, in you know that involves both Biden and um, Trump. So it, it's a loaded political issue. I think this is part of the reason why it was a mistake for the Biden administration to continue to only provide military support to Ukraine while not really investing in finding a diplomatic way of ending that war. Ukraine is in a worse negotiating position now than it was a year ago. It will be in an even worse negotiating position a year from now than it is today. Uh, and just throwing more money at it while investing almost nothing in real diplomacy, I think, has been a huge mistake, not just for U.S. interests, but frankly, very much so for Ukraine's own interests. And I think that will be culminated because if Trump wins, um, there's going to be about two, two and a half months before him winning the elections and taking office. A lot will happen between Russia and Ukraine during that period, I suspect. Good points. I mean, what, what, all everything I read about Ukraine is that uh, Ukraine will be split sometime in the next uh, 12 months. Part of it will go to Russia and a, a much smaller territory than it had before the war started a couple of years ago will remain as Ukraine. And and United States went in kind of, you know, lukewarm, or I should say heavy in the beginning, and then we didn't give Ukrainians the technology and the weaponry they needed to actually go attack inside Russia. I know, but if, if the U.S. Yeah. had done that, I mean, this is part of the problem of this entire approach. If the U.S. had done that and provided that type of a technology early on for the Ukrainians to go inside of Russia or, for instance, have gone for some of the things that people in Washington were pushing for, such as a no-fly zone, it would have meant that uh, NATO would have been in direct conflict with Russia. Not an indirect conflict, but a direct conflict. And we're talking about several nuclear weapon states in direct engagement with each other militarily. That's a disaster. I mean, it would the risk of a third world war was massive. So I think it was important uh, to avoid that scenario. I think Biden did right in, in you know, checking that level of escalation for that not to happen. But I think it was a mistake not actively looking for a diplomatic solution. Uh, much, much earlier, because it was based on the assumption that the Ukrainian counter-offensive would have been you know, dramatically successful. It seemed like it was dramatically unsuccessful, and all eggs were essentially put into that basket. Good points. I want to shift uh, just briefly um, to Iran. Uh, a year ago, well, a year and a half ago, when that young Iranian woman was uh, in a uh, were arrested and then killed by the morality police, quote unquote, morality police in Iran. <clears throat> there was lots of protests nation in Iran, outside of Iran, in the United States, in Fresno on a regular basis uh, by Iranians against this government. Uh, but nothing happened. I know I remember talking to two of my Iranian friends, Iranian American friends, and they said, hey, this time is different. And I my thoughts were until you get very active, get, I don't know, I'm making this up, a million signatures, and, and all over the country, Iranians get millions of signatures as sent to their members of Congress demanding, uh, you know, more justice for the Iranian people, you know, more freedoms, more opportunity. I mean, Iran has gone from one of the most uh, successful nations of the world in the 70s to a pariah state. Uh, until you you do you do those activities and put pressure on members of Congress, not a whole lot. Even then, maybe not a whole lot would happen because Iran would have to deal with Russia and China, who are big allies and supporters of of Iran, and that becomes a much higher level conversation and negotiation. You know, would Biden want to deal with that? But in your opinion, why did uh, why did the Biden administration? who talks about democracy all over the world, not get involved and put pressure on the Iranian regime to loosen up, not put pressure on Putin to back off on a support for Iran. Do you, do you have any uh, thoughts on that you can share with our audience? Sure. I, I think my fundamental uh, problem with the premises of the question is that Russia, China, or the United States are decisive actors when it comes to what happens inside of Iran on this specific issue. The United States obviously has tremendous influence on Iran, but influence on what's happening in Iran, I think, is a different matter. I don't think 
anything will come out of that. I think the only people who can bring down this regime in Iran are people inside the country themselves. Uh, and I think, you know, showing sympathy uh, and support for them, solidarity, I mean, those are actually very important things, but people should have a, um, uh, a moderate expectation of the direct impact that, that will have. Uh, and, you know, keep in mind, most of the diaspora um, uh, Iranian Americans uh, are, you know, 20, 30, 40 years removed from Iran. It's not the same thing that happened during the revolution in 1979 or 78, in which so much of the organizing that was taking place at universities um, in the United States and in Europe against the Shah were done by Iranian students who had left Iran just a year ago, just you know two years ago. So there's a significant difference. I think the connectivity between the people outside and inside is not at all what it was in the 1970s. The other thing I think is important to keep in mind when it comes to what happened in Iran, I think this was a movement that came out of just pure frustration and anger with a regime that was just getting more and more repressive, getting more and more undemocratic, uh, and just you know eliminating any hope that the young people in Iran had for the future. And many of them, in my view, quite understandably, had given up on the idea that, were, that there were nuances within the regime. So they didn't see the reformists or the centrists as any different from the hardliners and as a result, we're not listening to any of those uh, uh, leaders uh, from those groups. So it ended up being a rather leaderless movement inside that uh, expressed a lot of frustration, but didn't have the type of leadership, because it was leaderless, that could channel that pressure in a very strategic way to put pressure on the regime uh, in a systematic and sustained way. And then I think that leadership vacuum was filled by certain individuals on the outside, which I think actually ended up being counterproductive for the movement inside a country. Uh, and another thing that I think is also important to keep in mind is that from the outside, the type of sanctions the United States has been uh, imposing on Iran for decades now actually has made the civil society of Iran weaker vis-a-vis -vis the Iranian state. Uh, studies show that you know, these type of sanctions at the end of the day, make protests more likely, but also make them less likely to succeed. So you will have more protests, but fewer of them will actually be successful. And part of the reason for that is that under those very bad economic circumstances, the ability for people to sustain their protests for a long period of time to actually bring down the government becomes weaker much, much weaker because the economic situation is so bad. And, and it actually came through in some of the reporting coming out of Iran by Western media, interviewing protesters who said that, you know, if I go out and protest and I get shot and I die, my family will have no income whatsoever because the margins were so small. And, and these are things that one has to keep in mind because when we see countries having successful revolutions, it's usually not in a state in which the country is in a complete economic misery. More importantly, if they succeed in doing a revolution and in a state of complete economic misery, which can happen, of course, and has happened, but that then minimizes the chance that the revolution will actually lead to a democratic government replacing it, uh, rather than seeing what happened in 1979. One dictatorial regime was replaced with another. Great points. Um... We're going to, I'm going to take a 30 second break, uh, show something else. And then when we come back, I want to talk about uh, unfiltered, uh, why we have this show, several other questions and comments have, have uh, come in. Um, and I want to talk to you about, again, the future. I, I had of, a hard stop that actually. Oh, you do? Five you minutes do ago. I'm so sorry. Okay, hold, on. hold on. Before you go there, let me ask you okay. briefly. Uh, tell us what you see. And I know we, I asked you this earlier. Tell us what you see in, I mean, ultimately, Americans want peace in that part of the world. We don't want to wake up to the news that says people are getting killed, slaughtered, whether it's with our tax dollars or, or not. We, we want peace, prosperity for us, and, and we want to export this all, all over the world. How do you get to that, knowing that Iran has a conflict with the United States, knowing that Iranian regime, let's put it that way, knowing that we have Hamas, West Bank, Israel, is there a, I mean, in, in after the second war, we, the United States came in, became the peace broker of the world or the police of the world. 
And we promoted democracy, even though we overthrew some democratic elected governments, including Iran and in Chile. But by and large, we promoted democracy in Europe. We spent you know, hundreds of billions of dollars rebuilding Europe, uh, especially Germany. Can we have that same role, play the same role in the Middle East? Uh, we are still the number one superpower, probably by another decade or two, economically and militarily. Israel has got the third strongest intelligence service in the world and military. Can the two Israel and United States team up to broker a greater Middle East peace that involves all of these countries all and all of these actors so we could we stop this bloodshed and animosity and hatred and killing, killing of civilian people? What, what are your thoughts on that uh, I don't, before, before you go, please? I think it would be great if that was a possibility. And of course, when we take a look at what the U.S. did after the Second World War, um, I, I don't think one can be blamed for hoping that such a scenario could be uh, uh, viable once again. But I think we have to be very honest and frank and, and realize that the United States does not have much credibility in the Middle East. And whatever credibility it had on October 7th, 6th, by now, much of it is gone. I mean, most of the countries in the region are terribly unhappy with what's happening in Gaza. And they don't just blame the Israelis, they blame Biden because of the massive support that Biden has provided the Israelis. I mean, more than 10,000 tons of weapons and ammunition has been sent to uh, uh, the Israelis from the U.S. since October 7th. And as you know, uh, Biden has worked actively to block any ceasefire at the U.N., etc. I think the region has to find its own balance. It has to find its own solutions. We're past those days and that era in which a superpower from the other side of the planet could come in and, and impose a solution on the region. I mean, we tried that with Afghanistan. We were going to turn Afghanistan into Switzerland, and it was a complete miserable, miserable failure. Uh, after 20 years of fighting, the Taliban are still back in power in Afghanistan. We tried that in Iraq, etc. We don't have this capacity. The more we try, not only do we destabilize the region, we hurt ourselves. We uh, uh, um, impoverish ourselves and we hurt our own credibility. At best, I think we can help bring about uh, a diplomatic solution by being supportive of countries in the region themselves working things out rather than us coming from the outside and seeking to impose solutions on them. It would be great if it could work. It can't. It's already been proven that it cannot. And I think the more we try to live in that illusion, the more we hurt ourselves and them. I've got to ask one more question that just came in. What can an average American citizen do to help? Basically, bring well, I think the most immediate thing, yeah. I think the most immediate thing right now, in my view, and, and I'm putting this for the sake of releasing the hostages in Israel, in, in uh, held by Hamas, for the sake of ending the butchering and slaughter in, in Gaza, but also for the sake of making sure that we don't have an escalation that drags the U.S. into a war. For that, we need a ceasefire. I would call my member of Congress and express that view, because we already have about 70 percent of Americans who want a ceasefire, but only 60 members of Congress have come out in favor of a ceasefire. They need to hear from the American public, in my view. Great points, uh, Trita Parsi. Let's put up uh, the slide with all, with all your publications. Let's put slide 10 up. Thank you so much, Dr. Thank Parsi. you so much for having me. I appreciate it. Thank you. For, for, uh, thank you, and have a, have a great week. Uh, that was uh, Trita Parsi um, from um, Quincy Institute uh, for uh, basically for peace uh, and, 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 and what, what uh, state, statecraft uh, across the world. Um, for responsible statecraft. There we go. Uh, those, those are some of its books. Um, and le let me quickly put up uh, slides 35 and 36, which is what's coming up next week on Monday night. We have a double decker uh, supervisor. Those of you that are getting ready to vote for a uh, board of supervisor member that are e e either in Northeast Fresno or in Southeast and Southwest Fresno, uh, there'll be, there be, we'll have two debates, one at uh, 5 to 6 p.m. and one at 6.30 to 7.30 p.m. Should be pretty fascinating. And then the following Thursday, a week from this Thursday, City Council District number six, which is Northeast Fresno, uh, four folks uh, running. 
well, have uh, uh, there may be more than four, but four have have committed to uh, participating in the debate Thursday night. Um, again on CMAC and on GBWR.com uh, from six to seven p.m. Uh, thank you everybody for for watching uh, the pro the program tonight. I hope you enjoyed enjoyed Dr. Parsi's uh, presentation and insights in that part of the world. And uh, we hope to see you all uh, next week. Take care.